God willing, today we will meditate on the goodness of the Lord. Divine goodness is a topic very frequently revealed in Scripture. The truth of our Lord's goodness cannot be missed by anyone who reads the Scriptures. The Lord is good is a truth that is repeatedly established in the Scriptures. It is a truth that God's people must understand, appreciate, and rejoice in. All of God's people must enthusiastically meditate on this grand topic that the Lord is good. Oh, the divine goodness, our Lord's goodness, how great it is. The goodness of God is his essential character. God is essentially good. There is nothing bad in him, no evil in him. Now we have many, many scripture portions to read. I pray and hope that you will not be tired that I'm referring to very many passages today. But we shall begin with a statement of our Lord Jesus Christ and recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Of course, it is also found in Mark and Luke. Chapter 19 and verse 17. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 17. Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Well, as you can see, Jesus said this to a man who came running to him. Saying, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Mark 10 records this. Luke also records this event. And the man addressed Jesus, good master. To which Jesus responded saying, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Jesus was saying, every man is a sinner. Only God is good. Why did you put this adjective in front of the word master or teacher and call me good master? Well, it is very obvious Jesus was confronting that man's motives and intentions. Jesus was not saying he is not good. By the way, in the history of the church, when a group of people known as Arians, led by a man called Arius, rejected the deity of Christ, referred to this passage to prove that Jesus was just a man. He was sort of rebuking this person who came to Jesus and called good master for calling him good because Jesus was not God. 
And so they take Jesus' words in verse 17. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So they say, well, this is very obvious. Jesus said, you shouldn't be called good because only God is good. And therefore they say Jesus is man. But that's not what Jesus meant. It's very obvious. Jesus was actually confronting this man's statement that he was good without believing that he is God. Jesus didn't want any empty words of praise. Jesus wanted true acknowledgement. Jesus didn't want this man to come and say, you got a lot of good answers, so you are a good teacher. No, Jesus is not pleased to hear him in comparison with other men. Jesus don't stand in the same, ped in the same pedestal with all other men of the world. He's not equal to Moses or other prophets of Israel. He is higher and greater. He is the source of all truth and wisdom. He is the good one. And obviously, Jesus did not agree with this man's opinion that Jesus was just another good teacher, another good rabbi. So Jesus said, if you really see the goodness in me, then you should know I am what? God. Because only God is good. So Jesus said, concerning God and himself, that God is good. The triune God is good. And Jesus, in fact, put it this way, none good but one that is God. God alone is essentially good intrinsically good, absolutely good, perfectly good. There is no evil in him. So the goodness of God is asserted by the Lord Jesus when he said, none is good but God. And this teaching is throughout the scriptures. We are familiar with so many passages in the scripture that reminds us that the Lord is good. And God's people often engage in worship wherein they make clear statements that the Lord is good. So let's take note that God is intrinsically good as Jesus mentioned. None good but him. He is intrinsically good. Divine goodness is a description of God's character, God's essential character. It means that the Lord does not have any evil in him. It means that he does not love sin. It means that he is not tempted with evil. Evil has no part in him. He is pure. And he is gracious, kind, compassionate. In certain way, we can say that the goodness of God is synonymous with 
many of God's attributes. They are not the same, but sufficiently and adequately represent some of his attributes, such as holiness or benevolence, divine justice, he's a good judge, he's divine justice. So one way, when you describe goodness, you should never take goodness in isolation to other attributes of God. God's goodness is closely connected to all his attributes, including his divine justice. You see, some people think when God judges, he's not good to uh, people. Uh, he is avenging their sin, therefore he's not good. There is no goodness in him at that moment. And people blame God when he judges the world. When he allows people to be destroyed by their evil ways. People say God is not good. If he is good, how can this happen? But you must understand, without goodness, there cannot be justice. Goodness of God is closely connected with divine justice. Because goodness abhors evil. So punishing evil is intrinsic to God's goodness as a just God. And we can never forget this. Let us turn our Bibles to Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7. Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 to 7. The Lord passed by before him, that's before Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. As God revealed himself to Moses, the Lord proclaimed these words. You can see goodness is placed along with all of the attributes of God that are mentioned here, such as his mercy, his grace, his long-suffering, his truth, his forgiving nature, and his justice, his judgment. The Lord does not allow being good, his people to pervert justice. We have many, many scripture portions that talk about it. Would you return to Exodus chapter 23, or please move backward to Exodus chapter 23, and verse 2. The Lord says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Verse 6 of Exodus 23, Thou shalt not rest the judgment of the, thy poor in his cause. So God insists that his people must do justice because he is good. He wants to be good to the poor. If God allows injustice to happen, then the poor 
will be ran over by the powerful people. The poor cannot enjoy the goodness of God. So goodness of God is so closely connected to the justice of God that justice of God when it is maintained by God's people become a vessel of God's goodness. They are intrinsically connected. So when finally divine wrath carries out divine justice and punish the wicked, God is exalted as good, not as evil. You know, some of us wonder how we can stomach the sight of our dear ones in hell. I understand that and I cried over that thought of dear ones ending up in hell. It's a frightening thing. Even thinking about myself in hell where God's wrath is complete and full and never ends. I get scared. Many times I cried out to God, Lord, let this never happen to me. So we never like this idea of falling into the wrath of God because it is a place where there is no goodness of God directly experienced by those who end up in hell. We don't experience the goodness, but that doesn't mean God is not good. No matter how you may think at this point of time, when God's judgment is executed ultimately, when God sits upon his throne, in all his glorious majesty, holiness, perfect goodness, when he meets out his judgment against the works of men which defy God and embrace evil, nobody who is with God will shed one tear over those who is punished. But everybody, you read the book of Revelation, everybody is going to praise God saying, Thou art just, O God. Glory, power, and dominion belongeth to thee. You don't see anybody surrounding Christ upon his throne crying because the unbelievers are, are judged. Because God never judges an innocent person. God will never judge an innocent person at the end. Every man will be judged according to his works. Dear brethren, in his justice, he is not evil. He's not a capricious monster doing what he wants at the spur of a moment. He is carrying out his justice. He is punishing those who rejected his goodness. He is establishing his goodness and righteousness and judgment. So let's remember this. The goodness of God cannot be ever thought in isolation from all other attributes of God. And God's goodness is connected to other attributes of God as well. Not only to justice, but to all other attributes. We do know that 
when God's people talk about God's goodness, they also talk about uh, God's attributes such as love, grace, long-suffering, and goodness, so on. Just listen to this. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his good, for his mercy endureth forever. First Chronicles 16, 34. You can see the connection between goodness and mercy in that verse. In Psalm 86, verse 5, we read, For thou, O Lord, art good and ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all that call upon thee. So in Psalm 86, verse 5, we see goodness being connected to forgiveness, mercy. His goodness is also connected to truth, as we saw a while ago from Exodus chapter 34. The Lord is good, without a doubt. So remember, the Lord's goodness is, is essential character. And therefore, his goodness is seen in all his attributes. In all his attributes. He is good. He never, ever acts in an evil way. The reason why we sometimes hear people saying that God is not fair, God is not good, God is evil, because they are not looking at God as good, they are looking at themselves as good. Even though they do evil, even though the whole human society live in sin and propagate sin, yet they say to God, you are not good to treat us like this. We are such good people, how can you deal with us this way? But on the day of judgment, no tongue shall speak against him, but all shall confess that he is Lord. Because... No one will be judged without his conscience being borne out by God. Every man's work with every secret will be brought out. And every tongue and every lip shall be silenced by the goodness of God. And everyone will say, oh, how dreadfully evil I am and I'm worthy of this. Every knee shall bow before a great God. Who is good. He is good. O oh Lord, thou art good. Psalm 86, 5. He is intrinsically good. Remember that, my friends. The Lord is good. Always say it. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. That must be your conviction. Even when you go through painful experiences. Even when you experience betrayal by people. Even when you are so badly dealt with. You open your mouth and say, the Lord is good. God willing, in the coming weeks, we will study more of his goodness, even in dark providence that we sometimes experience. But let it be our conviction. For the word of God teaches us nothing but that the Lord is good. No evil in him. And indeed, his goodness is very great. It is infinite. God is infinitely good.
in Psalm 145, verse 7, the psalmist says these words. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The memory of thy great goodness. The goodness of the Lord is very great. He is never short of goodness. He is good and he is great in his goodness. In Psalm 145 verse 9 we read, The Lord is good to all. Psalm 145 verse 9. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies are over all his works. God sends his goodness to every creature. There is not a creature he created has not experienced God's goodness. It is so great. God's goodness is, is seen in the blades of the grass of the field and in the goodness of a king living in the palace. God is good, and God is good to all, even to his enemies. He has been good. In theology, we use a phrase, common grace, to refer to God's goodness to all people, including the wicked. He sends rain, not only to the righteous, but also to the wicked. So what shall we say? That God is good. He is very good indeed. His goodness is extended to all. Both in heaven and on this earth. Dear friends. The scripture also tells us about his goodness that the goodness of God endureth continually. So not only it is extended to all, but it is a ceaseless flow of God that the scripture teaches us. Psalm 52 Verse 1 says, the goodness of God endureth continually. Psalm 52 verse 1. And this is very interesting because uh, David was facing a terrible situation. He was being chased by King Saul. And then he went to a priest, namely Ahimelech. And when David came to this house of Ahimelech, he was hungry, he needed some food. But there was another person in the vicinity. He was an Edomite who was faithful to King Saul. His no name is Doeg, D-O-E-G. And he was a wicked person. He quickly reported to King Saul about the presence of David in Ahimelech's house, which resulted in the brutal massacre of this priest and many Levites. In the context of such brutality, David sang in Psalm 52, the goodness of God, what? Endureth continually. Not because we can parse every problem we face in life. Not because everything makes sense to us. Not because everything put a smile on our face. But God is good continually. That's the truth. Blessed is a man who can say it. 
at all times, for his heart will be comforted in the time of trouble. The Lord is good. He is intrinsically good. He is infinitely good. And he is good continually. The scripture also tells us in Psalm 33 verse 5 that the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. This earth that we live in, even though it's marred by sin, even though it has so many calamities, and some of these calamities are definitely the hand of God against a wicked world. You know how the flood killed the people in Noah's time as a matter of God's judgment. We know how fire destroys Sodom and Gomorrah as a matter of God's judgment. And yet the Bible says the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. You know, when God created the heaven and earth, God not only beautified the heaven with the celestial glory, it is unspeakable beauty up there. Whether it be the sight and sound and the experience, all are good in heaven. It's a wonderful place. We all wait to get there, right? Where there is no tears. No sickness, no death, no hospitals, no doctors and nurses. Doctors and nurses are all only in this earth. Clinics and <laughs> mortuaries and undertakers, will, if they are Christians, they all be there without this profession, okay? It all ends here. Because it's a good land. It's a perfect land. And when God beautified the realm of his throne with such perfect goodness, he also had mercy to fill his footstool, the earth, with his goodness. Not only in heaven we see goodness of God. The Bible says, the earth is what, my friends? Full of God's goodness. This is why in Psalm 27, verse 13, David said, Psalm 27, verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He said, I would have long fainted and failed in my life if I had not believed to see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living. Dear brethren. This world. The footstool of our great God. Where his steps. Are planted daily. To guide us forward. We have plenty. Of goodness. Surely. Goodness and mercy. Shall follow me. Because God filled this earth. With his goodness. It's not a perfect world because sin has entered. But God's people can find endless goodness of God in the midst of all the struggle that the devil has brought into this world. He is good to all. He is good to his people. And even his enemies often participate knowingly or unknowingly in the goodness of God. Oh, how wonderful it is to remember. Again, remember, the Lord is good. The Lord is intrinsically good. The Lord is infinitely good. And His goodness continues without cessation. Continually is good. If you ever shed a t tear, let it be because you have not realized that God is good. You fail to say that he is good. 
Every time when we allow our hearts to be too despondent and then remain in that state, it is a real indication that we fail to think that the Lord is good. You remember, that's why David said, if I have not believed to see his goodness, I would have what? Fainted. I would have. Dis I would have destroyed myself, in other words. I would have no strength to live. So what we have seen thus far is a God of perfect goodness, endless goodness, infinite goodness. And he has extended it to us. Just want to quickly make mention of this verse, which probably I would expound in greater detail in this series. And that verse is Psalm 119, verse 68. In this verse, the psalmist, of course, I believe it's David, talks about the goodness of God in this way. Thou art good and do as good, teach me thy statutes. Now look at the first phrase. Thou art good and thou doest good. Thou art good and thou doest good. Don't you think the goodness of God is asserted there in those two phrases? The Lord is good. But you may ask, so what? Well, he do us good. He do us good to all. In fact, that verse tells us, if you want to know the goodness of God, how is it, how it is extended to you? Read the scriptures. The truth. The statutes, they are instructions of God's goodness and good works. God not only is intrinsically good, but he also extends his goodness to his people. So dear brethren, this is a profound confession that God's servants always made. That the Lord is good. Now, take your mind back to Matthew 19, where we saw Jesus confronting the man who called him good master. Jesus, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? Only God is good. None else is. Jesus didn't want him to call him good without real confession. Of what he believes. You know, we make our children sing, God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, is so good to me. I hope you don't sing that beautiful children's chorus without making a confession. We never sing these songs for the fun of it. Let's rejoice. Let our children sing that song. The Lord is good. And at the end, the song ends. He is good to me, right? God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He is so good to me. Amen. It's a grand confession. But no one who believes that truth shouldn't sing that song. It means nothing. Jesus will confront us. Why do you say that I'm good? Only God is good.
the goodness of God to all his creation and particularly to his people is a great subject of the Bible. May God help us to continue to uncover this great truth. Or we may discover that great truth for his glory and our benefit. I think it's one Puritan writer called Thomas Manton who said this. He is infinitely good. The creature's good is but a drop. But in God there is an infinite ocean or gathering together of good. You know, sometimes we look at people and say, you're good. But that's only a drop. And sometimes it's because God sends his goodness through them. They show you kindness to you. Or they will pray for you, say, you have been good to me. You will tell friends. But dear friends, that's, that's only a tiny drop. God is an infinite ocean of good. If we realize that drop of goodness that somebody show us is so wonderful... If we see that, that drop of goodness shown by a man who is marred with evil is really something so beautiful, then how much more? A God who is untouched by evil, perfect and holy, extends his goodness. He is so wonderful. He is wonderful. God is good. God is wonderful. He is wonderful to me. Now, you and I must learn not to think of God based on what our mind would say with reference to all the things around us. We must see God as he is, as he has revealed himself in the Bible. And then start thinking, what goodness has he done to me? Start counting his goodness toward you. They are innumerable. You must remember them and praise him. God's word reveals his goodness. God's special love for his people shows goodness, his love in Christ. Well, that is uh, really a profound matter, God's love for his people. God is good to Israel. That's a powerful truth that we read in the scriptures that the Lord is good to his people. Psalm 73, verse 1. The Lord, truly God is good to Israel. Truly God is good to Israel. Even to such as are of a clean heart. So God's goodness, in, according to Psalm 73 verse 1, is specially sent to those who are his. Those who are redeemed by him, cleansed by him. God is good to Israel. He is good to you through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we think about the goodness of God in relationship to all of God's attributes, you can say God's goodness is an extension of his love toward his creation, 
particularly to his people. As God's people, when we talk about God's goodness to us, we see that he is being good to us because he loves us. And being his children, because he loved us in Christ and made us heirs of his blessings, we see our goodness as far exceeding the goodness that all others experience in this world. Do you know even the angels are not called the children of God and heirs as we are? In fact, the angels of God who witnesses God's goodness daily, the perfect goodness of God, unmarred with sin in the presence of the glory of his throne, are sent to us as ministering spirits to bring God's goodness to us. You remember the story of Jacob running away from his angry brother Esau? poor boy, very likely a teenager, running away out of fear, going through a land he never traveled before to visit his uncle Laban. He's running. It became dark. He had to rest. No street lights. Of course, all the luminaries of heaven is shining and sending the light. That's why he moved. But he found that comfortable stone that he can use as a pillow. He lays it on the ground and he lies down with his head on that stone. He falls asleep. God shows him a magnificent dream in which you see angels going up and down a ladder. At the end of it, the Lord's promise is that I'm with you and I will bring you back. And those angelic beings climbing up and down was sending this message to Jacob that God fetches his angels to minister to his people. God is always in the business of sending his goodness to us. So not only his goodness is manifested in all of this earth. The earth is full of his goodness, as we noticed. So all the material things and all the workings of the nature, all are to bring God's goodness to us. We believe that. He also sends his angels to minister to us his goodness. The unseen world which God created also worked to benefit us. God's goodness is also extended to us by his special works. We call it benevolence, is benevolence. In other words, God's works of compassion towards all his creatures. And that is extended even to the wicked ones. As we saw a while ago in Psalm 145, verse 9, the Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his work. The earth is full of goodness of the Lord. Psalm 33, verse 5. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, we hear the Lord's words. Matthew 5, 45. He maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Matthew 5.45 So those benevolent acts of God 
includes such things as his relief, the provision of relief that God sent to us in our sufferings. It also is shown in the fact that God has not judged us quickly, even though we are deserving of his judgment. The delaying of his judgment, even to the impenitent, shows that he's good. His goodness forbears them, in other words. And that's why in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Paul said this, Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering? Despiseth thou the goodness and the forbearance of God? This is what, as I mentioned a while ago, some people call it common grace. But we must be careful not to entertain the idea that God is gracious to all men so all men may be saved. No, that's not in the Bible. But God is good to all. You see, brethren, when finally God judges people for their sins, the fact that they have ignored and neglected the goodness of God, the fact that they were ungrateful to God who is good, the fact that they did not yield themselves in humility and faith to God becomes a curse to them. That will be the reason for their judgment. That would silence every sinner that they have despised the goodness of God. Romans 2, 4. But to us who are his children, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God shows his redemptive Goodness. The love of God that redeems us and fills us with all spiritual blessings. Now, there is in theology, when you talk about the love of God, this is a big topic we probably would study, God willing, another time. A division of how God's love is expressed toward his people. There is what is known as God's benevolent love merciful love that brings all goodness to all people. That general providence of God. General benevolence to all. But that distinctive love for God's own redeemed or God's elect is known as complacent love. Now, of course, today the word complacent uh, has bad connotation. It actually originated from the word in Latin, complacentia, which means uh, to be satisfied with the goodness you received. You see, slowly this word changed in, in the use of the language. This is a, sometimes a terrible thing. Uh, many good words became bad in these days. This is one example. The word complacent originally meant 
being satisfied the, with the goodness one received. You are so satisfied, you, you're happy about it. You rejoice in it. That's complacent. But you see, slowly people start to think in this way. Well, some people who are so blessed with good things, and they have this, uh, you know, terrible attitude of pride and the smug appearance that they have. And so complacency became, you know, I have everything, I couldn't be bothered about you. I'm all right, I don't need your advice. That sort of prideful contentment became the meaning of the word complacent. But in theological world, when it is said of God's love as complacent love, or God loves us complacently, it means that God exercises his love to his highest degree to satisfy his children. He sends his goodness, so much so that you will say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He satisfies my soul with his goodness. Remember Romans 8.28 All things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called and to the called. Now Romans 8.28 uh, 8, tells us that we love him because he called us. Ekaleo is the Greek word for the called, comes from, from which we get the words like ecclesiastic with reference to church. The church is the called out people. And he called us out of the world to rejoice in his love because he first loved us, we love him. And so, to the call, to the church that is in Christ. God says all things work together for good. Even the rough and tough times. Even the painful and sorrowful things. Even times of tears and, and fear. Sometimes it becomes God's chastisement for us. Sometimes it becomes a means of strengthening our faith, like in the case of Job or Paul or others. And sometimes we don't know, but all for the glory of God. Somehow we are being used through those sufferings to praise God for the comfort of others. For the teaching of others, how we endure the suffering, become a good tool in God's providence to teach others to be brave and strong in the struggle. There are so many purposes, we can't really get our mind around it because God's goodness is infinite and therefore the goodness that he extends to us, even in our difficult times, have infinite applications according to his purposes. So in God's complacent love, his special goodness come to us even in difficult times to satisfy us, to satisfy our soul. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Psalm 73 verse 1. Didn't we read earlier in Exodus 24? He keepeth his mercy toward us. 
even to a thousand generations. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, abundant in goodness, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So we who are the called can see how goodness would come to us from God. Now let me come to the conclusion of this message quickly by adding one more point. If God's goodness is extended to us all through this world that he created, through special acts of providence, and through his saving grace and the special blessings he offered, even in difficult times, we can also be sure, based on all that we said, and I mean, based on scriptures, that his house, the church, is a place of God's goodness. All things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. The called people is the church. Their getting together is an expression of God's goodness. In the church, you come to seek the goodness of God. Here you not only experience the goodness of God and you become a channel of God's goodness to others. It is really a terrible situation when God's people do not come to the Lord's house and see his goodness. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my, my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for that, that, that is the anticipation of every man and woman uh, that seen the goodness of God coming to his people, his complacent love, his satisfying love that fetches his goodness to us. When we come together, what great joy to think of his goodness to us all. So, dear friends, let us remember the Lord is good and his goodness is to be sought in his presence. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for teaching us that the Lord is good. He is in intrinsically and immensely and continually good. Oh, his goodness is so wonderful. In thy house we see thy great goodness. Even in remembering you, that you will be the good Lord of your people. May we confess it with sincerity of heart every moment of our days. Lord, bless thy people with thy goodness as we come to the end of this worship, as we sing one more time to thy praise. Receive our praise, O God. Praise thee, the Lord, for the Lord is good. In Jesus' name we pray.